Altos History. I'm your hostess, Nancy Schnabel, and with me tonight is Rosemary Meyerot, who is a historian of Los Altos Hills. And she's going to tell us some of the history of Los Altos Hills up into the time of their incorporation. What's interesting about Rosemary is she's worked hundreds of hours in a little room in back of the Los Altos Hills Town Hall, and what makes her very unique is that she's done it as an unpaid volunteer. She's an example of how one person can make a unique, major contribution to a community. She was a 1986 recipient of the joint Los Altos, Los Altos Hills Community Volunteer Awards. Rosemary, welcome to Access Los Altos. Now, now many people might not realize how difficult it is to be a historian and to collect historical data. And you told me you even have some mystery families that you're trying to find out more. And maybe you in the audience will be the person that can help us find these missing links. But how did you get interested in the history of Los Altos Hills? Well, it all started back in the early 60s. I have a daughter who was a polio patient who had lots of surgery. And she had to have home teachers um, to, to help her, and one of them was Virginia Tafe oh, of, the, of the Tafe family. And she was just, a, she started telling me and Gail all about um, her family's history in the hills. And I thought, oh, this is really interesting. So then um, Florence Fava wrote her wonderful book, The Los Altos Hills, A Colorful Story. And I couldn't wait for it to get out. And in the meanwhile, she, um, started the Los Altos Hills Historical Society and really needed some help. So I joined the Historical Society and worked with them for a few years. And then Florence re resigned from her position of um, um, Los Altos Town, Hills Town Historian. And I was then president of the Historical Society, so the council just appointed me right. to come in and um, take over doing the history. Oh, I'm not an historian, well, she per sa se. She says this, but you, I mean, she knows more history than most of us will ever know. Florence Fava, just in case there's someone in our audience that doesn't know who she was, devoted a great deal of her life to helping learn more research about the Ohlone Indians. And could you tell us a little bit yes, about the Indians? Yes, that, that that's another here? reason that I, was, I, got, I got interested in the history, I'm a, a in lover of um, Indian history, and so that was another thing that got me into it. Um, what were the well, Ohlone's like? The Ohlone's were just very peaceful um, people. That um, they lived actually down on the bay in the winter, and then came up into the hills and hunted deer and even fished for salmon in Adobe Creek, I'm told. Now, I, I've never heard of a salmon in Adobe Creek. Sounds but, like a long uh, journey. Yeah. yeah. But um, in those days, the hills were just lush with elk and deer and berries and just everything that they could want to live. It's amazing to think of that. And change. then, of course, when the uh, missions were built. The Ohlone's were practically made right. slaves. A after the Ohlone's, the Spanish came, 
And the prime Spaniard, if we want to put it that way, that came through our area, and I'm going to look till I don't say his name wrong, was Juan Batista de Anza, the expedition in 1776. And he was a very courageous man. Uh, he was, one of the things he was most known for, he never let his soldiers go hungry, which was very unusual in those days. But he found the inland way to Monterey Bay and San Francisco Bay. And on his way to San Francisco Bay, he passed through both Los Altos and Los Altos Hills. Where in Los Altos did he, hills did he go? Well, it, uh, it was traced on a map that he came through approximately um, Edith, Edith Avenue and into um, along Fremont Road. And in 1976, there was a reenactment of the De Anza Trek. And one of our um, townspeople, um, Joseph Docknell, took the place of Corporal Robles and he rode on the Lancers. Um, well, it was a group of horsemen. Mm -hmm. And uh, they wore authentic costumes. And our town had a uh, costume made for Doc, and that is now in my little history room behind a glass case. And could you tell me about the land grant? Well, it, Los Altos Hills is comprised of two land grants, um, um, San Antonio Rancho, or Rancho San Antonio, and La Purisima Concepcion. And La Purisima Concepcion was granted to two Indians um, who were emancipated neophytes from the uh, Santa Clara um, mission. And their names were Jose Gorgonio and his son uh, Jose Ramon. And it was approximately 1840 or that they were granted uh, this property. And <clears throat> they were, um, Stories are told that they were attacked by thieving um, Tulare Indians who burned their houses and injured their wives and made off with their horses. And so they had to rebuild their um, huts. They lived like Ohlone Indians mm -hmm. in the regular Ohlone Indian huts. Now and who took, um, who took them over? You told me something about they. Somebody thought they weren't doing a very good job of it, and well, they sort of stepped in. Um, Juana Briones de Miranda decided she wanted to move down to, and buy the land that the Indians had. So she made them an offer of $300 uh -huh. for, uh, let's <laughs> Two see, <inches> approximately, of <laughs> well, each, each rancho had about 4,000 4, 436 acres. Now both San Antonio and uh, and um, Purisima Concepcion. Did she get both of them for $300? And no, she she got just um, essentially Puris, La Purisima Concepcion. And um, anyway, when she bought the property from uh, the Indians, they couldn't write, yeah. and so they they signed their life away with exes. Oh. <laughs> and um, Juana built uh, an adobe house of three rooms on um, what is now Adobe Road, Palo Alto. And uh, it's been added on to. It's quite large now, but um, it's still standing. And um, let's see, she um, was a, quite a a woman. She was very I've heard strong. That she well. was. Um, someone told me that it, it was so difficult to travel in those days, and she had a lot of children, and she gathered up all the kids and all the foodstuffs, and by ox cart, with her holding the reins, it was a three day trip to San Francisco to sell her wares. I mean, the, the idea of anyone doing this, but she was a very small woman. I, mean, I, I always think of her as a real pioneer powerhouse type, and we're lucky to have had her. Well, she, she was the nurse to um, all the Indians and um, other people around. She ministered to the sick and brought them into her home. So um, she didn't have a very happy married life, though. Well, she was one of the first women to ever divorce her husband, and he was so bad, they said that he committed heinous crimes against her and civilization and they gave her his lands. 
she became a very, very wealthy woman. Mm -hmm. Well, this land that she bought, uh, Santa Clara Mission cattle had grazed on these lands. For That's 14 miles away from mm -hmm. that area. So she owned a they, lot. they had quite a bit. Uh, she didn't own all that, but I mean, the mission sent the cattle over. And to, didn't you uh, tell me that a lot of our roads in Los Altos Hills yes. are named after members of mm -hmm. her family? Uh, well, first of all, I, I'd almost forgotten. We named one Briones in, in the 1960s. And, but um, some of the streets that are still in existence are Miranda, Manuela, who was a daughter, Concepcion, um, Josefa, which runs off of Elena Road, and I guess that's all from her family. And then there was but, another um, family that well, contributed greatly to Los Altos Hills history, wasn't there? Well, let's see. The, the, the person who was granted the other um, uh, uh, piece of land, um, it was, um, let's see, Juan Prado Mesa. He was granted um, Rancho San Antonio in 19, 1839. And the site of his first adobe is supposed to be up on a hilltop on um, a bordering um, Summer Hill and um, El Monte. And could you tell me a little bit more about, I, I, I'm going to skip a little bit here, the, the Murphys and the Tapes were a family that intermarried. The Murphys settled Sunnyvale. And they intermarried with the Tapes, and Martin Murphy gave his daughter, Elizabeth Yuba Murphy, quite a wedding present when she married William Tape. Tell him what it was. <laughs> he, he bought 2,800 acres from Juana Briones, and that was the wedding present of um, Elizabeth Yuba Murphy Tape. And so we have some street names after her. Um, Good. Um, Elizabeth, which is now deleted, and someday I hope to get it back on. And Yuba was deleted. And then, but they had children, five children. And, and we have names after They all were them. named Elena. Now that's the road that I live on. Oh. And that is from yeah. one of her grandchildren. Now, did part of that land, excuse me for interrupting you, did, did part of that land include what is now Foothill Campus? Yes. Now their first house, the, the first one that William and um, Elizabeth Yuba Murphy moved to was here on Foothill Campus. And they moved uh, here in 1861. Wow. And that house is no longer standing. But it was situated houses. over where the faculty house is I see. in that area. But are, there is a house that is standing that was built. Let me consult my notes. I'm terrible on dates. I have to look at notes. Uh, the Griffin House. Tell us about the Griffin House because that's here on Foothill Campus also. Well, the Griffin House is, uh, was built in 1901 by um, Willard Griffin, who was a shipbuilder from Boston. And um, he bought the, um, I think it was 90 acres of land for 10,000 in gold coin, it said. And he, he really made the, um, the property a show place. Now, where is that house now? Can you tell people well, in the Well, the audience? Griffin House is still standing but here. Where, where, can you tell people well, where it is? Well, it's right across from the um, fire house, which was the carriage house for the Griffins. And, and then behind the Griffin House, he built um, a, a lovely Japanese shrine and a uh, bridge at, over a... Um, a lake, a man-made lake, and I think it was probably fed by Adobe Creek that went through this uh, Foothill campus until it was diverted into mm -hmm. concrete when it's amazing the campus how, how this was built. area has changed. And now we have this mystery family. And see if you can help Rosemary on this because you've all heard of the Dana. And we have a Dana Road in Palo Alto. There's a, a Dana in Mountain, Mountain View. View, and there's a, is there a Dana no, in Los Altos Hills? No, it's a Dana house. A da and there's and a Dana house, and I'm going to read right off my script if you'll forgive me. Um, there, a Henry F. Dana owned half of Rancho San Antonio, but the man who built what is now the present faculty house of Los Altos, of Foothill College, um, was a Henry Henry A. a Dana, Dana and his wife, Lily P. Dana. 
and um, it was assumed that Henry, Henry F. Dana built the house, but from researching it, he was dead by the time that house was built. So it had, I've checked with um, Liz Dana's husband, that's Liz mm -hmm. Dana. But no, you can't find Dubinick. any links? And he has, no, they didn't have anything in their uh, um, genealogy, and they had quite a few books of it. Anybody out there that so, knows this missing link, please let us know uh, by calling either the station or call it Rosemary at Los Altos Hills. Well, uh, that, that house was sold in, by Dana in 1908 to Grace Holt, who was John Lohman's mother. And the Lohman and house is the now Lohman the faculty house. Is right? now, the Lohman house is now the Foothill faculty. I'd like to shift house. to the, how were the early children in Los Altos Hills? What, where, where did they go to school? Well, the first little one-room schoolhouse was built in 1901 on, it's now Duval Way, but it was actually Robleda Road. And um, it went from the first to the eighth grade, and the last class was held there in 1953. And um, I went to a reunion last summer of all the old people that went to that school, and it was really fun. And now they it's They were a all, you know, agricultural. Their fathers were into, uh, well, raising prunes and apricots yeah. and uh, cattle. And the, the children all went to school on the dirt roads. They rode their ponies or um, came in little pony carts. <laughs> and um, all the Tafe family mm -hmm. went to that. And I, under, I understand another thing that uh, there were a lot of were tank houses in Los Altos Hills. Could you tell us a little you know, bit about those? That's one of my loves, and they're all getting torn down. Yeah, I wish they could but, save them. Um, Two of my favorites are um, the, the uh, one on Campo Vista that was built in 1914 by Alan Cranston's family. And as you all know, Alan Cranston is our state senator. And um, that, that's still standing, and it's on property owned by Donald Winbigler. And uh, next to a lovely home that was built in 1926 by Dr. Crane. You know, the white one you mm -hmm. were asking me yes. about. Oh, it's gorgeous. Another thing and, I'd like to ask oh, you. Then, uh, oh, you want me. to hear anything else about the, well, the other really picturesque water tank is, at, is over on Fremont Hills Country Club land. And that was built for a widow named Martha K. Lynn in 1906 by, um, uh, with help from Harold Brubaker. The Brubakers, you know, yes, were. Yes, Brubaker. Um, that rings a bell. I'm going to skip a little bit again. Uh, you know, you mentioned to me, and I had never known this, that we had wineries around here on what is now called Page Mill and then Arrastadera Roads. Would you tell first how Page Mill Road got to be called Page Mill, and what is the meaning of Arrastadero Road? Well, let's see. Ara Page Mill, um, they used to take lumber down and to actually Page Piers, um, what, what do you mill? call it? <laughs> <laughs> lumber mill in Palo Alto. They, they took lumber from the uh, sawmills in the mountains. Mm -hmm. And then how about Arrastadero? And then Arrastadero um, was, uh, it, it means to drag or skid road. Wood was dragged from the hills to the bay where it was used to fuel um, the wood burning ships. Ships used to come down and pick up all the supplies from the area or things that the farmers would mm -hmm. uh, sell and take up by boat to San Francisco. How times have changed. Yeah. You, you told me about one of the wineries, uh, a Mrs. Eugenia and Andriana. Yes. Oh, tell, she, tell us more about her. Well, she and her husband decided they wanted to buy a farm in what, um, what's now Los Altos Hills in 1922 and they walked all the way from um, Middlefield um, along a rastrodero and having read this ad in the uh, in a San Francisco paper and fell in love with um, the area and bought it and so they farmed it until 1935 when Mr. Andriano died and Eugenia decided to make the um, barn into a winery. She was from Italy and um, had learned the art of white winemaking from her father. So she, with her three children, 
um, established this winery. And it really got to be well known. It was on the corner of um, Arastradero and uh, Purissima. And you've actually and, been there, haven't Oh, yeah. You? And when I first moved to the hills in 56, you were allowed to go there and take your own bottle, gallon jug, and for a dollar you could get your choice of three wines. She was famous for claret and uh, sauterne, and what was the other one? I can't think of it. Didn't she give but, your children uh, some sauterne? Anyway, sometime? my my children just loved to go there <laughs> because um, she would take us down her basement. I remember her opening up those cellar steps and. We'd go down there into the little tasting room, and she'd even give the kids taste, and I thought they thought it was wonderful. <laughs> so. Another thing I'd like to touch on, because I had never heard of this before you told me, we had a flying field in Los Altos Hills before Moffat Field. A, a family named the Eisenberg family had their own airstrip. And Rosemary, could you tell us some about that? Because it was an era yeah. that was just unimaginable well, now to have something um, like this. The, his name, well, Los Altos Hills had, had its own landing strip before Moffat Field was even envisioned. About 1928, Rudolf Eisenberg, who was a wealthy man who owned sugar, a sugar plantation in Hawaii, who had a passion for airplanes and fancy cars, cleared a swath next to his home and um, made this, uh, he created Eisenberg Field. And it was a strip used by many local aviators. It was a primitive runway, but um, it had it witnessed many landings and takeoffs of Wacos and uh, Fairchilds and Pipers by some well-known daredevils of the day. Jack Nystrom of Palo Alto Airport, who is now dead, his son was one of our mayors. Uh, Raphael Myers of Los Altos. Bill Radcliffe and Fred Harvey, and and even um, let's see, he even made a, a hangar in the shape of his airplane. And Bill Radcliffe humorously tells about having a, a windsock on this hangar, even though there, but there was only one way to fly in or out, and it it was just really it was there for looks. Could you tell me how John? Foles and his wife, Eleanor Cranston Foles, got involved with Los Altos Hills. Uh, you had mentioned he was very active in the early history. Well, and we're, we're kind of ahead of ourselves. Yeah, we, we, we're going to run out of well, time, so we're going to so have to sort of go ahead. So I know what you're, you're, yeah. you're leading into was um, this house that um, uh, Gerda and uh, Ruolf built in 1928 on Old Trace Road, known as Feather Hill Farm. Uh, was sold in 1942 to John Fowl and Eleanor Cranston Fowl. And um, so I'll, I'll get into them when I'm telling you about the uh, um, uh, founding of, of the town. But um, maybe you, <coughs> am I supposed to describe any well, pictures? Well, I, I, um, I think we're going to be running out of time yeah, on this. So but, what I'm going to do is... Uh, we're going to show you a sequence of pictures and give you the whole picture, overall picture, of what was happening on this airfield. And I'd like to talk about our Heritage House Museum because while Los Altos Hills and Los Altos started as one town, we separated over the years. And a couple of years ago, something wonderful happened. A group called the Apricot Alliance was formed by Abby Ahrens, Frank Lloyd, and Ed Barnes. Los Altos' first merchant's home was going to be demolished, and they wanted to save it. So Abby Ahrens and Frank Lloyd offered it to Los Altos Hills as a possible museum. Ed Barnes fell in love with the house, took all sorts of community abuse so that he could uh, help people rally behind it, and Los Altos Hills accepted it, and it is now our her your Heritage Home Museum. We became one community again for a short time. And I think it was a sort of wonderful thing that mm -hmm. we did. It really did uh, make Los Altos yeah, it, and Los Altos Hills it, really close. It, it, was a, it was a great feeling. Uh, we were both, that's where I met Rosemary, we were both part of the, of the Apricot Alliance. And there must have been hundreds of man hours that we spent being part of uh, 
raising money to refurbish the house after it got moved, and we had a weekend where we took people through. It, it was just a wonderful experience. How do people make arrangements to see Heritage House Museum? Well, they can. I met the uh, town hall on Tuesdays from one to five, and or they can make an appointment with me. Okay. But it's usually open every day because um, two of the rooms are used as um, meeting rooms for our. Um, town and I was given the job with Mary Stutz to furnish the house and try to find um, you know freebies <laughs> from the town <laughs> kind. but we did end up buying things and um, to, to furnish it in the t the time period now, the house built. is what they call an arts and craftsmen's house uh, these houses were greatly built all over the country from about 1880 to 1920. And what makes the house unique is that it's not unique. It's the kind of house that thousands of sort of small people, modest merchants, that kind of person lived in. And, you know, we save all these wonderful, gorgeous villas, but we don't have how most people lived. And that's what to us, when we were working in the Apricot Alliance, was the thing that made it so important. This was how we might have lived, and we wanted to save this house. Uh, if you have a chance to see it, it's a very typical arts and crafts house. That was, that was the time when they started building things in. Adjustable shelves in a closet, a pass-through from the kitchen to the dining room. We think these things are modern, and they're not. Uh, Rosemary, I wish we could cover so much more. Could you come back? Uh, sure. Again, oh, thank you. Because we, we have, haven't covered everything. I know we've, we've just barely. <laughs> we have this pile I mean, and piles of things we wanted to tell you about. Each, each picture could make a whole meeting. It's a, a whole, uh, history is fascinating. Yeah. And I want to say to our audience: Do you realize that you are part of your history? We're looking for pre-1940 pictures of apricot picking and drying of the old interurban railroad class photos, turn of the century horse and wagons, early cars, family events, aerial photos, if you have any of these things and would share them with us, would you contact us, and where's that address? Write to Los Altos History, care of Access Los Altos, 12345 El Monte Road, Los Altos, California, 94022. Share your history with us. I'm Nancy Schnabel, and I want to thank you for watching Los Altos History.